Hey, it's Chris Schmidt with the Average Joe Sports Show. Matt Rule speaks and puts a bow on 2024's class. Mitch Sherman here. We're going to talk about Caitlin Clark coming into a sold-out Pinnacle Bank Arena. Hi, it's Bill Dolman. Will the Nebraska men's basketball team ever get a win on the road? It's Elijah Herbal. We'll wrap this show by locking in our predictions for the Super Bowl. And I'll tell you one thing about me. I could never pick the Chiefs. go it's episode 29 the average joe sports show bill goldman mitch sherman elijah Herbert, i like Chris that Schmidt. was that a new intro you kind of sound like dak prescott yeah here we go average joe sports uh, show i'm not i'm not swearing under my breath after a back-breaking interception in the playoffs but uh cowboy fan hate bring it to me uh, you too uncle andy my brother-in-law always screams how about them cowboys but mitch will get to to Matt Rule, we'll get things kicked off here. Uh, Rule met the media and uh, kind of put a bow on 2024 and some nice late ads for Nebraska. Yeah, you know, just your standard 51-person recruiting class. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and counting. And Nebraska's wrapping up here in, in early February. I don't know, for a coach who's looking to cut the roster size down to, what do we talk about? most recent episode 120 something like that they're they're moving in the the opposite direction but i certainly get what they're doing and he's trying to to uh to bring in competition and create competition and you know one of the interesting things that matt rule said on wednesday in his press conference first time we heard from matt rule since december 20th so that's some uh that was nice it was a, seven weeks is is like a like the, an eternity in the college football off season to not hear from the head coach he said that it's difficult for great players, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing him, but it's difficult for great players to develop when they're not surrounded by other great players. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to build that. He's trying to build that culture. And if you don't have the luxury of signing a class that's completely full of four- and five-star guys, what you have to do is you have to go look for diamonds in the rough and, and uh, overturn stones and find guys who, who got dropped by other Power 5 programs at some point in the recruiting process like we saw with – some of these walk-ons um, who, who joined the class at the last minute and, and, and looked at, at various points in the recruiting cycle like they would be scholarship recruits in the Power Five. And you have to try to develop those players into um, the best version of, of what they can be, and then they provide that competition. So um, the big name to come out of, of Wednesday was Keona Wilhite, the six foot five, 240-pound defensive end who was not someone that they had to overturn a rock to find. He was committed to signed actually with Washington and Kalen DeBoer before um, Nick Saban sent the dominoes falling and, and Will Height was released from his NLI and, and here he is at Nebraska. So that's a big win for Nebraska beat out UCLA and, and Texas was interested in, uh, in Kiona also um, as recently as, as mid to late January. So, that's a big one at, at a big position, the pass rushing position. But the rest of these guys were just kind of like, you know, finding, um, you know, finding leftovers in recruiting. And, and he said he thinks that three or four starters will emerge from this walk on class, which includes um, a dozen or so players from the group that Nebraska signed in December. Um, you know, we could go through and try to parse out who those guys may be, but I don't think the staff knows right now. And that's probably a good thing. You know, there's going to be a lot of turnover though, as, as much as this recruiting season has gone on <laughs> for so long, I mean, but it was signing day, I thought, I'm thinking, hasn't every day been signing day uh, yeah. since, uh, since mid-December, it seems like? But, look, they're going through winter conditioning, and spring ball is going to come around. And I think that Nebraska fans might be overwhelmed, maybe too strong of a word, but I, I think that the, the feel-goods about the, the, the so few names that left – um, the first round of, of transfer portal, I, I think that there's going to be a significant uh, uh, wave of players who will no longer be with the program um, to find a new home someplace else. Maybe they'll be a, prom a prominent program. They might find themselves more, uh, you know, maybe in a division two or, you know, what is it? The group of five or whatever they call it. But I, I think Nebraska fans have to be prepared to, that some of the players that they've gotten accustomed to seeing, or rooting for, uh, hoping that they would see them in the future and develop. 
It's just not going to happen at Nebraska. And you know how you do that through this portion of the offseason? Is you tell Corey Campbell to raise the standard in the, in the weight room, to raise the standard in the offseason training that they're doing. I would expect that, and you could hear this a bit in Matt Rule's voice on Wednesday, that I would expect that the, 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 where the bar is at for the expectation that the players on this team need to meet is going to be raised three or four notches between now in the second week of February and by the time spring practice gets rolling at the end of March. Whatever these players became accustomed to in Matt Rule's first year at Nebraska, as far as how hard they were expected to work, that's just going up because that by itself is going to lead to some players saying, this is enough for me. And those are the guys they don't want in the program. And then other decisions will be made by the players based on where they stand on the depth chart at the end of spring. Players want to play. And if you're fifth on the depth chart at left guard, you very likely are going to look for somewhere else in the fall. And that's when the, when the portal comes into play at the end of April, the last two weeks of April, the portal will be open again. And that, coincides directly with the end of Nebraska spring practice spring game on April 27th this year, a little later than usual. So um, you're right. It is going to happen. There is going to be attrition and it's something that Nebraska needs to happen because Mm -hmm. the locker room can't hold 160 guys. And I think the most likely spot you got to look at as it stands right now, defensive back. Have they reached 50 defensive backs on the roster just yet? It feels like they're inching closer (laughs) and closer. Yeah, Evan Cooper kind of has carte blanche to uh, to go out and, and get the guys that he wants to get, and that's because Matt Rule trusts him so much with his with his eye, his ability to evaluate, and that it goes for not just what not just defensive backs, but wide receivers, linebackers, whatever it might be. And you know, the result is that he ends up with the they at Nebraska ends up with a ton of defensive backs on the roster. And hey, it's a three three five defense, so half of your defense almost is is comprised of dbs you need a lot of those guys but to your point there's more than what will fit and there will be players who who leave from that position group i'd say the same thing um you know maybe about the oo line Mm -hmm. but um you can generally never have too much depth up front on the o line and and they do have a lot of it right now so um db would be where where i'd look before um, any other position group Guys, what's killed Nebraska over the years has been not signing day or signing day part two or even portal acquisitions. They've been very active and attractive at doing it. It's been the retention part, right? It's been attrition that there's really talented guys that just for whatever reason over X number of years have not stayed and, and been developed. And you're kind of chasing your tail, trying to plug holes uh, in different position groups. One kind of ground floor uh, position group that that rules really targeted last year in his first season. And then this season, when we talk about Will Height, they've got a, a slew of young pass rushers that are that, that contributed, made some plays, made impactful, significant plays. And oh yeah, by the way, the polar bear and and Ty Robinson are back. So you, you got to love what Nebraska's future holds uh, with old guard and then some some young promise, not just in 2024, but what 2023 yielded for you. It, you know, it's interesting also, we, we forget about some of the players that were uh, off to promising starts in the rule era last year, like, like Singleton, you know, uh, yeah. goes out with an injury. And everybody was pretty high on him. And it sounds like some of the players that they brought in are almost identical to what he brings to the table. You've either got, you know, a plethora of DBs or DB slash linebackers hybrid. And then you've got linebackers and you've got linebackers who also look like rush ins. And then you've got the varying styles of defensive tackles, whether they go 330 or 250. So, it, you know, Matt Rule talks about the what the positionless offense so often. Mm-hmm. Except for the quarterback, they got a position, but everybody else it seems to be positionless. But in, in in reality, you know, you're just going with on defense with a bunch of really fast, athletic guys. They're going to fit the particular situation. And we saw what 25 guys play in the, that very first game against Minnesota. That was a tell for what that defense can be. 
But then think about also those guys that, that were significant early on, that had some injuries, that are going to be out. And there's going to be some of those guys that won't be in spring ball, too, as he talked about, you know, on offense, like Garcia Castaneda, um, Malachi Coleman. We may not see much of him in spring ball. So that, that's going to be interesting, too, because, you know, they've got spots, right? But what's going to happen around them? Yeah, Tony White, the the head coach of the Nebraska defense, or at least the, that's, the, that's the, as he gets paid like the head coach of the Nebraska defense. You know, he subscribes to the same kind of philosophy on that side of the ball that Matt Rule does when you hear him talk about the San Francisco 49ers and the positionless offense. And it was interesting to hear Rule get into some of that this week. And and he was asked as the 49ers get ready to play in the Super Bowl, which we'll talk about later in the in this episode about how uh, fullbacks are like tight ends and tight ends are like fullbacks and wide receivers can play running back and running backs can play a wide receiver. Really on defense, it's the same thing. Um, your outside linebacker can play defensive end. Your safety can play nickel. Your nickel can play um, weak side linebacker. Your corners can play safety. Uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting how Nebraska is built from the ground up offensively and defensively with similar philosophies as far as the versatility that they have within the program. And I think that's where the benefit of having an, ex- an experienced head coach comes in and a head coach who doesn't necessarily specialize on one side of the ball. Matt Rule, of course, has, has coached the offensive side of the ball. He's coached the defensive side of the ball. So he's going to bring, um, you know, a, a, a way of thinking that, that is, is, that goes back and forth between, between both. And, you know, that, that bleeds into other aspects of roster construction too. How many players did we see in the first year with Matt rule who moved from offense to defense? There are wide receivers like Bryce Turner and Jeremiah Charles during the season that, that went to the defensive side of the ball, just to add more DBs because that's what they need. But no, really it's like, they're, they're not just positionless within, within their own side. They can go to the other side. You saw Jason Machachak, who moved from the defensive side to the offensive side. Ruquan Buckley moved from the defensive side to the offensive side. They'll recruit guys like Mason Goldman, who they're not sure if they want him on the offensive or the defensive side. And then he, he, he transitions into the program, and they see how he works in the weight room and how much weight his body might hold. And, and here he is a year into this thing, and they're like, this guy's a really promising defensive player. If you asked me a year ago, I would have thought that Goldman may have ended up on the offensive side because he was more dominant there, or, or I thought he had more, more, he showed more promise there um, as a high school player, but these coaches obviously see him and players like him throughout, throughout the fall, throughout the spring, and they're equipped to make these decisions. Players aren't, aren't pigeonholed for, for one spot or even one side of the ball. And those, the, you know, those philosophies that Tony White and Matt Rule and Marcus Satterfield bring to, to, to this program, they work together and work in harmony. And Mitch, just add one more name to those, those guys to watch in the 2024 class. What side of the ball are they going to play? Eric Ingerson, I think, is going to be mm-hmm. uh, an right. interesting one to follow. Could be a defensive end, could yeah. be a tight end, could be an offensive lineman. Uh, he's got a, a frame at, I think, six foot seven. That you could add weight to, you could really have a, a matchup nightmare uh, type situation for an offense at tight end. But at six foot seven, you can have him play an offensive tackle as well. He's a, a guy to follow in this twenty twenty four class. If you're looking at guys that that you know are kind of representative of that, you know what we want to have guys that are playing positionless football. He can go just about anywhere. Eric Ingerson might be the best example of that mm-hmm. in the twenty twenty four class. Well, and it takes players who are willing to be able to do that. I think there are plenty of players that are in the recruiting pool who aren't open to that idea, who think that they're an offensive player or a defensive player and come in with the mindset that they're going to play on the, on on one side of the ball and only that side of the ball. Eric Ingerson is a great example out of Papillion La Vista. Who's coming in and saying, I'm going to do whatever it takes to help this team. I mean, he, that's, that's, you'll, you'll hear that from, from every player, but he legitimately feels that way. And, you know, I have some knowledge about his, you know, his background and that that's what he's bringing to Nebraska, he's the, the the former Pitt commit who um, decided to stay home, and and um, a big part of the reason is because he wants to help this program, and he doesn't care if they find a home for him at defensive end. That's great. If it's tight end, if it's offensive tackle, great. Whatever ne- the Nebraska coaches want him to do, he's going to be willing to do, and and it only works when you have players with that with that kind of an attitude. <laughs> If uh, if Tony White is the head coach of the defense, who is the collaborator defensive coordinator? Is that what the new title is? 
Yeah, co- 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 OC. Well, I don't know what you guys think co OC means, but it's it's <laughs> the collab collaborative OC. Collaborator coordinator. <laughs> co co means find me a quarterback, keep him healthy. <laughs> And let's complete some throws on third and seven. No, I just got to get out of Matt oh. Rule inventing coaching positions. Co means, oh, you want some more money? Here's some more money. <laughs> Co is all sometimes, some, sometimes you need a title to justify um, <laughs> everything that comes with it. And, and look, no. Glenn Thomas, the co-offensive coordinator, whatever co stands for, has been in this position with Satterfield and, and Rule before, and and they've worked in well, Rule's always been at the top, but Satterfield and 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 Thomas have kind of worked in in interchangeable ways where one's been in charge of the offense, one's been in charge of the tight ends or the quarterbacks or whatever. So I think that's where some of the confusion among fans and media came in. At, at, at hey, you know, and and Steve Sippel asked the question just flat out uh, one of, one of the first questions in the in the press conference. On Wednesday, who's going to call the plays? And you heard Matt Rule, you kind of scrunched up his face, and he said, Sat's calling the plays. Sat's the offensive coordinator. Said that day one. T- <laughs> yeah, how many more times do I need to say this? Sat's, Sat's <laughs> call- he's the he's the OC. We don't even have, he's not a, he's not co-OC. So I, that's, you know, it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a subject that, that Rule feels strongly about. Um, Sat's going to be the guy with the play sheet in the, in the press box, you know, calling things in, you know, maybe, maybe, by a by a, a helmet microphone to uh, to Dylan Rayola and and Thomas will be down there on the sidelines whispering into uh, the quarterback's ears. When does this uh, helmet mic happen? Yeah, Rule seemed pretty confident that something was coming down. Um, you know, there's there's always in the in the spring, maybe early summer, late spring, early summer, uh, rule changes that 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 come through. Um, a lot of that uh, comes out of various winter meetings, you know, I don't know if, if this would have, have to happen at the, at the conference levels, or if it could be an NCAA enacted thing. You know, I, I think the big 10 and the sec can just do whatever they want. I was just going to say, it's going to happen when Greg Sankey <laughs> and uh, Tony Petiti say that it's going to happen, you know? Yeah. The way that he <laughs> talked, the way that he talked yesterday, um, I would expect it sooner rather than later. Yeah. That, you know, w- with whatever power moves the sec and uh, the big 10 are making right now. And, Fox and ESPN and Warner uh, Discovery and all the TV, all that stuff that's going on right now in the boardrooms, they're going to come up with whatever rules they want to come up with whenever they want to come up with them, and everybody's going to have to play by them or just get left behind. And I think yeah, I think it'll happen. They, maybe maybe even experimentally, perhaps in games going into this season, and then they'll adopt it fully uh, in twenty twenty five. I think so. I mean, can't they just can't these thirty four teams in these two leagues just say, hey, we're going to do this? What are you going to do about it? You know, Maybe you know, if you Nebraska know. comes up with the with the appropriate technology, that will be what gets Nebraska back in the AAU uh, academically. Mm. That's that's all that needs to happen. The two hundred oh, million, the, the two hundred millions is sound argument as well. But uh, the uh, the <laughs> AAU right to, to keep Nebraska in the Big Ten, of course. Well, uh, now do all three quarterbacks get to have a, a helmet mic? Is my question, or just the starter? Yeah, they've all got them. I don't know if they're, they're the only ones turned on at a time, perhaps. I mean, they're not trading helmets as, uh, as I, one I comes didn't think on the they field would or be. goes off. But there's three quarterbacks as we talk a little more moving into spring. Right. Sats calling See the plays. There. There's three quarterbacks. There's three helmets. There's three microphones, allegedly. And uh, it's time to, to get reps for all three of them and let someone rise up, find a solid backup, and – Keep grooming uh, whoever is that third quarterback. Yeah, Rule said he would love to have four, but right now he loves to have three. You mm-hmm. know, and his his justification <laughs> for that, his explanation for that was that look, a year ago in spring they had four quarterbacks who were taking reps. At six scholarship quarterbacks on the roster, but Logan Smothers and Casey Thompson were were sitting out in the spring. Imagine if they would have been healthy and they tried to get six quarterbacks reps. But um, even at four, he said it was difficult to get enough reps for each of the guys to truly be able to evaluate them in the way that they wanted. Well, he didn't say to evaluate them in the way that they wanted, but he said that these that these quarterbacks today, the three who are on the roster on scholarship, that they need a lot of reps in order to have 
the, the, the chance that they deserve to win the starting job and be in position to win games for Nebraska. So that was the same that was the same criteria last year. They were looking for a starting quarterback and they were looking for to give someone a chance to show that they could win games. And so I guess Jeff Sims, he didn't get enough reps to, uh, to <laughs> truly do it the way that, that, that they wanted um, here as we look back at this a year later, but no. I, so if you have three in the spring and, and you come out of the spring maybe you can go find someone in the portal because he would like to have four going into the season. How that all looks and works out, I'm not quite sure. But don't you think the reason for wanting four is – I, I know there's a, an even quarterback competition, right? And they're all one, A, B, and C right now. But really, you know, we're all talking about Dylan Rayola in all likelihood being Nebraska's starter and uh, Heinrich Harbour going into a position that he's more suited for, like an H-back as a backup and emergency quarterback, and that they would like to have Danny Kalen redshirt and preserve a season, and that's why you would like to have the fourth one, to be either your number two, which frees up Harbour to play other positions and be an emergency backup, or bring in another one who is your emergency backup, and Harbour maybe plays you know a couple of snaps here and there to keep him fresh at the position. But look, Rayola is going to be the one that all the attention is going to be on early. But I, I think the reason for four is just you can hope you can redshirt Danny Galen. Well, can I? Yeah, I think can, you hit it on the head. If if it works out perfectly, then it's Rayola um, as the one, Harburg as the Taysom Hill um, utility knife guy, Kalen four games at max, right. redshirting, learning, growing, and then somebody else who can step into that mix and be ready to go if you need it while also keeping Harburg fresh. But you want Harburg to be able to do various things in your offense where he can help you most. Well, how do we feel, I mean, about if you're looking at a fourth-string quarterback, it's rare in college football to reach that point. It does happen occasionally. I think a big question is how does the coaching staff feel about a kid like Luke Longball, a walk-on quarterback who, as far as I know, is still with the program. If you get good reps in the spring from him and you, you feel decent enough about him, that could be another thing they're evaluating. It's not a, a sexy talking point for shows like us or other radio shows or the journalists to write about, but that's going to be a part of the evaluation process this spring is do you feel good enough about a walk-on quarterback being able to go out there and for the most part hand the football off that you feel fine with him being your fourth-string quarterback? It, it's not as, as simple as, well, three scholarship quarterbacks means Nebraska just has three quarterbacks. They got some walk-ons that are that are back in the room as well. They're going to be competing maybe to be that fourth guy. So Matt Rule doesn't feel like he has to go bring in a transfer quarterback to be a fourth scholarship quarterback. Or, or let's say, let's say Arch Manning does not beat Quint Ewers <laughs> out at Texas. He decides to go into the portal. You bring him in as your emergency number four. <laughs> I mean, Bill, you've got it all figured out. I'll have what the, you're smoking, Bill. I'd like please. to be a step ahead. <laughs> no, that's fine. The the thing that you got to get, and I think that you can appreciate, is that this staff will get them ready. Whether it's number one or, God forbid, you're down to number four, and and that's what's been so that's what's been missing is the the development. And I'm anxious to see the starting point with with Dylan and what he can do. But I want to see uh, what what Harburg can bring, just because he's been he's been limited, right? It's it's limited with a passing offense. He's done a nice job with his with his feet, with his size, with his speed. But let's get the kid watered a little bit and see what he can do throwing the football. And I know that was hit or miss last year. He made some plays with his arms, uh, some positive plays, but he made some some not so so great plays with the ball security. Let's see the kid throw the football and actually get tutored for a summer or a spring. Yeah, we know he's got an arm, um, but he was he was under fifty percent on his completion rate last year, and and you also the thing that's exciting about him is you saw his running ability, you saw his physicality, and I think you can dream about and, and envision the way that he can help this offense if he's not uh, stuck in a role as a backup quarterback. So. Right. Um, it's an exciting thought and how he can help you. And they can certainly use his help. You know, even as Nebraska brings in weapons in this recruiting class and players develop, um, you know, there, there's plenty of guys. I mean, like Demetrius Bell as a young wide receiver, I think people are going to be surprised by him. I think people are going to be surprised by Quentin Ives as a young running back as he develops in this program. We don't, we're not even talking about the transfers 
Um, there's a number of, of, of weapons that are out there that we're not talking about right now. Still, Heinrich Harburg in a, in a hybrid role is, is in, would be invaluable to this offense and, and would be a chip that they would love to be able to play. But the only way that you can do that is if you've got somebody else who can do more than just hand the ball off. And mm-hmm. you know, this is an, it is an opportunity, Elijah, for, for Luke Longball. I mean, he's in the equation. They just don't know because he hasn't thrown the ball since he was in high school. He went to Iowa Western and redshirted. He came to Nebraska last year and didn't play. So it's been two full years since he was out at Sioux City East throwing the ball. And that's not enough to give you the confidence that he's a guy who could go into the game as a second string. And really, you're looking at a second string guy, uh, potentially, or a third string guy, depending on how you use Harper. So that's why you have to think after spring about the portal. And I, and I don't know. I mean, it takes a unique kind of player who's going to come in and know that they're probably not the starter when you have a true freshman set to be in that position. And, and, and that's where it gets tricky for um, Nebraska's personnel and, and recruiting staff and for, and for Glenn Thomas to, to identify that player. You know, the interesting thing, too, with, this, with the discussion about San Francisco, and it always comes to my mind when uh, you know, Matt Rule talks about the positionless player, and I think we've all kind of come to understand what that verbiage means and what it's all about. But when you watch San Francisco play, the best and most important player on that team is a running back. Brock Purdy's a great story. But you don't have Jerry Rice or Jamie Williams. You got George Kittle. Uh, but it, the most important player on that team is the running back position, right? Christian McCaffrey. Serviceable wide receivers. Ayuk's good. They wouldn't be in the Super Bowl if they didn't have quality players at all the positions. But it still comes down to running the ball and having a great running back. Now, does Nebraska have that? I think probably serviceable might be the right word, especially if Irvin and Johnson and Ives, you know, develop and those other two guys come back healthy and the transfers work out. But for all of the sexiness of San Francisco's offense, it still gets down to the most black and blue position in the game of football, really. And that's the running back. Well, you, you talk about really fast. This is a, a bit of a, a side note here. You talk about the fact that you have to have other quality players in that offense. Think, According to Matt Roll yesterday, we were close to having both Christian McCaffrey and Brock Purdy in Carolina. Do you think that team would have made the postseason still? I'd say no. <laughs> <laughs> Good he question. Did say that he, wanted to, he wanted to put Brock Purdy on his draft board, but as I think we re- we've come to realize, Matt Rule wasn't making all of the decisions or many of the decisions about who the Panthers drafted during his time there, yeah, let alone Frank who they Frank put on the board. found that out too. Yeah. 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 Mitch Sherman, Bill Dolman, Elijah Herbal, Chris Schmidt. It's the Average Joe Sports Show. Give us a, a find and follow on social media, the AJ Sports Pod uh, on Twitter, and then the AJ Sports Show is where you can subscribe on the YouTube channel. Tell a buddy and uh, give us a rating, Spotify and iTunes as well for the audio portion uh, of the podcast and keep growing that subscription list. Guys, we'll wind down with, uh, Coach Rule, we've talked quarterbacks, we've talked sat, we've hit on pass rushers. How about winter conditioning attitudes? Is there was a call out to a uh, a former Gator? <laughs> it wasn't so subtle, but Mitch, back to your your early point here about raising that bar. Rule made it abundantly clear that you got to work harder because what you worked at last year was five and seven. You got to be much better. You've got a real opportunity this year with a new yet unclaimed bigger Big Ten. This is a year for Nebraska to possibly make a move, and uh, you'll need all hands on deck to do it. They've been building that roster. They've been trying to develop, and uh, the, the attitudes, the leadership, who you follow, and who's your, uh, your alphas, that's being shown right now, and get on board or get gone, right? Yeah, you know, we heard from Rule – Last last season, um, ahead of the season, and he called out a couple of guys that I remember. Anthony Grant, number one, um, just for and he was he was he was out. He was suspended um, for a period of spring ball, I believe it was, um, just because he wasn't doing the things that Nebraska needed him to do. And then uh, obviously he called out Anthony Grant for his fumbling issues, uh, specifically in 
preseason camp during the scrimmages. And then we heard about Josh Fleeks, the Baylor transfer, who was a veteran uh, who played under rule at Baylor. And he called him out for being out of shape when when camp began or overweight when camp began in, in late July. So this is not a new thing, what he did with Micah Mazuka, the transfer from Florida, who, who also uh, played at Baylor early in his career. And Rule just said he's got a ways to go as far as learning the standard that's required at the University of Nebraska. So not a new thing, um, definitely eyebrow raising, and I'll be interested to follow that storyline with Mizuka, who's slated, I would say, to be the starting left guard for Nebraska when uh, when the season opens. He's got a lot. He's got a long time to to get things on track. He's just just begun in Lincoln, and I would expect that he's going to hear that, and it's going to reinforce whatever message has been sent to him internally. On the flip side. He's very happy with a guy like Jamal Banks, who has come out and been a tone setter from the beginning in doing things that were asked of these players away from the field to continue to build the culture that Rule Rule wants. So that's things in the community, going to other sporting events. Uh, Banks has come in and been exactly what they're looking for in raising the bar and setting the expectation within this program. So that's good to hear. I thought the thing that really stood out in that regard was when Matt Rule said, you know, last year was good. But what was good last year has to be is, is average. Now that we have to, you know, build on that foundation. That was just getting to know the players, letting the players get to know them, know things that the atmosphere has changed. There will be expectations, not just in your conditioning during the winter session, but there's going to be that Husker supporting Huskers, the uh, the community service type things, all those things. And you're right, he was effusive about Jamal Banks, right? Uh, everybody's excited that he's back in town. And apparently, you know, for a guy like him who, who did well at Wake Forest, maybe this is the kind of challenge, not just the playing time and the opportunity, but, but, you know, this is what he, you know, wants to get out of his college experience and good on it. And Matt Rule has not been afraid to to praise when, when worthy, and as was the case with Fleeks and Grant last year. And, you know, calling guys out this year, that's another way to, you know, to kind of call the herd a little bit, as we've talked about with uh, spring ball coming up. Well, let's flip from football to basketball. We it's have the Average to? Joe Sports Show. We we need to touch on, you know, what February, the rest of February is going to bring, plus two in March. Nebraska drops to Northwestern last night, 80 to 60, 68. It, it shouldn't have been that close. I think Nebraska emptied their tank against the Illini to try and get that wild road win didn't happen. They kind of got hosed, but the offensive rebounding has been a nightmare. The turnovers, a nightmare, and it's just been problematic in what, what irks Nebraska fans is they can look how they look at home, but then you see a glimpse of the, the road mentality. They, they looked different. They looked good. They looked as good as they've, really ever looked uh, away from home against Illinois. And you follow that up with being a couple of steps slow. I know they played four games in, in 12 days, so they're wearing down a little bit potentially, but uh, not an excuse or reality because they just looked out of sorts. And then they got blitzed, man. They got blitzed on the drive, the drive and kick. And there's just too many uh, – butchers defensively <laughs> i mean the the double team on the baseline's all well and good but they just keep getting smoked from the three-point line every time they go on the road bill you know it, that the the illinois game it, they lost to illinois twice right yeah fair good i take. mean that that and in in watching last night's game it you, i think they played okay maybe the first five minutes um, in the last five, in the last five, in the last five, but I think you, you give them that we got to come out. We, 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 we got to give the effort. We, we did it at Illinois. And then the, there was just nothing in the reserve tank and what they put forth in a, in a great effort on Sunday. Uh, and I, and I think they got shortchanged a little bit on a few things. Uh, again, um, Illinois beat them twice. And uh, I think Northwestern is one of those matchups that you, you play them 10 times and it's a 5-5 five, five series maybe. Uh, maybe it's home and home. But 
that was a winnable game, I thought, going in. I, I, I was surprised with the return home after the Illinois game. Yeah. And and then going back, and it's not a it's not a long trip. I mean, it's an hour flight, and you know everything is is right there for you. But but still, you know, I I, I would think there's something in the budget to stay out there for an extra couple of days. And I've heard that you can take classes online and <laughs> get all your academics taken care of. These guys of. go to school, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for now, <laughs> Dartmouth might have something to say about that in terms of coming home and all that. But if there's that, one place in the country where they should be going to school, it's, it's Dartmouth. But I'll let you continue, Bill. <laughs> well, when they when they do their collective bargaining agreement, it will be interesting as to what the blueprint is for everybody else to uh, to follow. But I, I just the the logistics of Illinois and the scheduling also four games in twelve days. And remember when when they beat Purdue, they had to turn around and go on the road to play at Iowa like a couple of days later. There was there was no real break after Purdue. It's been two game preps for most of the season for him and Fred's I, I call it bitching uh, and he has every right to he's he's complained a, a, a few times in, in media sessions about that because he's just wondering all right dude another two-day prep it's not about enjoying a, a great moment Wisconsin or Purdue it's oh <laughs> sweet I got a tired team that just emptied the tank against the top right. five and now you got to go on the road. Well, the thing is, well, though, they've is got Northwestern. Go Northwestern. I know they're playing at home. I know they get the the boost from that. But they also played four games in twelve days. And you saw the graphic on on BTN during the game. Three of the the four people within the Big Ten that played the most minutes in the previous fourteen days played for Northwestern. And that's what's so surprising. And I understand that there is a big big boost you get from a home crowd in terms of your energy. But Nebraska looked to be playing on tired legs. Northwestern appear to be playing on fresh legs, and they're really in the, the same circumstance in terms of the games they've had to play over the past two weeks. Well, Northwestern played a Wednesday-Saturday, um, and they were both overtime games, just like Nebraska played two overtime games last week. But Nebraska was on a Thursday-Sunday schedule, and then, as you mentioned, Bill had to travel back to Lincoln and back to Chicago. So I think it's a little bit in Northwestern's favor. But, you know, when you get tired like that and you're on the road, um, you know, it just comes down to focus, and it comes down to um, – you know, your your ability to be tough and, and fight through the tiredness. And clearly Northwestern was better than that than Nebraska, which I think which is I expected um, considering all, all of the situations and, and the travel weariness that Nebraska had. I really thought that the next chapter of this season it was set to begin on Saturday night when Michigan comes to town. And, and not that you chalk up a loss before it happens, um, especially you know, Northwestern's a good team, but it's not like they were playing. Uh, you know, at Purdue, uh, this is this is where it, it, it kind of resets. And this is where the tide starts to turn. It is another short turnaround um, before Michigan comes in, but Michigan's last place in the Big Ten. And then you have a week off before Penn State. So four of the final seven in the regular season are at PBA. And, and there's not um, – there's, there's only one top 100 NET team um, in, that, in that final stretch. So Nebraska should be able to gain some momentum – over these final seven games. And that's clearly what they need in order to make a push to, to, to be in the big dance. They have fallen down to sixth, seventh in the Big Ten. You've got a log jam tied for six with Indiana and Michigan State. Minnesota's gotten hot. They've won three in a row. Wisconsin's fading a bit. They've lost three in a row, but they're still, you know, a, a, a separate number three. Northwestern's in there at four. And then, of course, you have Purdue. Uh, up there uh, along with the Illini. So, you know, what kind of resume boost can you have other than just stockpiling wins, marching yeah. towards 20, maybe 21? I mean, that's what's got to happen for Nebraska. The other side of it, that double-edged sword, fellas, is this team could go drop one at Michigan to end the regular season. They could go drop one at Ohio State, the two worst teams in the league. They could also drop one at home to a, a team that's been as physical as Minnesota and Rutgers. So they're not out of any danger right now. They've got to really kind of put their their head down and just and just grind, and that's worked at home. But they'll need a couple road wins, I, I believe, because they're really in the danger zone. Don't I think they're think still on the right side of the line. I think they're still on the right side of the line as long as they can hold serve, and that means win all of the home games and find mm -hmm. one on the road. I don't think they need to necessarily find two. 
Um, it'd be great if you could win at Ohio State and at Michigan. And they've had some some success recently against Indiana. Um, but Ohio State and Michigan, certainly Michigan, would seem like those are more winnable. Um, but but if they can win, um, what they what they they can take care of business at home, even find one win on the road, and then win one uh, in the Big Ten tournament. That's twenty two. And I think that gets them in without a whole lot of sweating on uh, on March 17th. All three of those teams you mentioned, Ohio State, Indiana, and and Michigan, all three of the seats are warming, if not flat out hot. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. Jawan Howard, Mike Woodson, and uh, oh. at Ohio State, uh, head coach. They, yeah. they escaped. He's, he's forgettable. <laughs> yeah, right. Holtz, is it Holtzman? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, those are three – programs that are that are making the headlines for the wrong reasons at this time of year so what's the mindset for their players going in trying to win one for the coach or does that really matter at this stage uh but i was going to ask him a moment ago and mitch you're much closer to your the, you know your brothers and sisters in the in the media it seems to me sort of from the outside looking in and as an observer of it that the media is just w- wishing for fred hoiberg Nebraska, but Fred, just win a road game, and we mm-hmm. will pontificate you the best we can into the tournament because everybody loves Fred. <laughs> Fred does not have an enemy, okay? But if, if Nebraska could just get a game, a, a win on the road, no matter where it comes, that given Fred and his likability, the way Nebraska has battled this year, for the most part, yeah, they've had the road wars, the, the toughness that it is at PBA – uh, they've got to figure out a way to get a defensive rebound, but if they could just get that one road win in conference play, maybe not to have to play every day in the Big Ten tournament, that they are ready to preach the gospel of Nebraska to be in the field of 68. I think I'd go as far as to say that it's the only thing that's holding back, and it's not just the the media in Nebraska, but you hear the commentators on BTN going right. down this road yeah. before and after some of the Nebraska games on that network about how he, he's a candidate for Big Ten Coach of the Year. And I think that would be you, – you would hear that being screamed from the rooftops if Nebraska had one or two conference road wins. If you win that Illinois game, I think they're banging that drum after the, after the game about what an incredible job Fred Hoiberg has done. But the, the, just that, that little – that one last step to get over the hump has so far avoided this team and – what it would take, yes, is holding serve at home. You should win those home games. Certainly don't drop one of those because that's when you start to go on the other side of the line and really get in the danger zone and find a way to win one out of three on the road. And, and he may get it. I mean, if they get to 21 wins in the regular season, it wouldn't surprise me at all to see him win that award as Big Ten Coach of the Year. So let's dive in real quick before we get to the Super Bowl. And or do we want to play this game of trying to predict Nebraska basketball? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just get a defensive rebound, okay? You, know? you, you go with a bigger lineup, and the, the dude you insert into the lineup gives you 16 minutes, two turnovers, the big guy putting the ball on the ground, and by the way, zero rebounds. And he's not alone. It's just, it's just rough. Because they all are just some of the, the, the looks, the conversations, they were frustrated with one another. And then you, you get back to the shot selection. And then you get to, to, to Tominaga just getting lit up. And then it was, it was, it was troll night uh, at Northwestern where it's, it's – uh, let's make fun of uh, Kisei's reaction uh, in the three he hit against Northwestern where it was earmuffs time. You know, everyone who hit a three, which is about everybody, just <laughs> going earmuffs uh, on, on Kise reminding him. It was a little blood-in-the-water revenge mood last night, a little something extra by Northwestern. I like it. Northwestern's not really known for that, uh, that kind of ha- having that kind of a uh, fervor with their, with their fans. I mean, certainly the football stadium that does not have that kind of <laughs> intensity at, at really at any point, although – Snob Stadium. They, yeah, I mean, because you can hear the bottles of peppermint stops get knocked over. Yeah. That's how dead it is there. <laughs> it may be coming in 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 the future with the with the, uh, the the kind of season that Northwestern unexpectedly had on the football field in 2023. But I, you know, I, I'm I'm going to be honest. I didn't watch much of the game 
on on Wednesday night. I was coaching 13 Good for you. playing baseball, <laughs> and we were we were getting in some tunnel work. And I checked in with Kent and Jake at the beginning of the game, and I checked my phone a couple times to see how it was going. And I had my my AirPods in my pocket. I was going to pop them in while I was throwing BP, and I decided no, I don't. I don't. <laughs> I don't have any. It was like six. They were down 13 or something when I checked midway through the first half. And I said, I guess I'm going to hear very, very little of this game. And and I at, at, by the time I got out of that out of that building, it was it was all but over. So um, I can't I can't uh, I can't give you my analysis of their of their poor rebounding or shot selection or whatever was going on. With You've their, seen it before. With their I was going to say, yeah, you might have been tuning in and thinking, did I hear the Rutgers? Am I listening to Rutgers again? Right. The, Rutgers, did I get the Minnesota game, game, game again. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the Minnesota game. I went to bed at halftime and was surprised uh, when I woke up the next morning. But that was just the beginning of the uh, of the road woes for Nebraska and the Big Ten. So it, it's I, I'm I'm confident. You want to talk predictions? I'm confident it's going to end at some point this year. They are not going to go into the Big Ten tournament with an offer in the road column. Um, okay. And I think it's going to be a big uh, check in the box that they need in order to to be safe on Selection Sunday. Well, Mitch, if they don't get over that hump, and I hate to put that out there into the ether, but if they don't get over that hump, they don't get a road win, I'm going to need you to do the in-depth scoop this summer on what happened at halftime of the Minnesota game because something must have happened. I'm not sure if they, they stepped on some old thing at the, uh, at the, the, the barn, barn there. I'm not sure what spirit they pissed off, but they pissed off somebody <laughs> at halftime of that game if they don't end up getting a single road win because it's, it's got to be a curse. <laughs> Speaking of curses, um, if we transition out of basketball, what's going on with Nebraska softball right now, Elijah, as, uh, as we tape this podcast? We don't talk about softball much, but I think this is worthy to bring up. Yeah, Jordy Ball exiting her first start as a Husker in the third inning. Awkward delivery on a pitch. She ends up going to the ground. Had to be helped off the field. So not the way you want to start off the Husker career. A lot of excitement, a lot of buildup for Jordy Ball in her career at Nebraska. Should be noted, she did get off the field partially under her own power. She was helped off with a slight limp. So maybe that's a sign of encouragement. I didn't get to see the play because, uh, you know, we were doing this podcast. Uh, it's 8.30 on a Thursday night. They're actually playing right now. Uh, Huskers find themselves down, but Jordy Ball helped off the field. So uh, we'll just, wait more information just, on that. What a buzzkill. Just incredible, just man. Same thing. <laughs> God, we have been hyping this thing up since June. I mean, this was the biggest story in women's sports for Nebraska, you know, outside of every year on the volleyball court since I don't know when, since what the women's basketball team went undefeated in the regular season. I mean, Jordy Ball, the hometown girl, the home state girl is coming back to pitch for the Huskers and she gets injured in the third inning of the season opener. Oh my gosh. I hope she's okay. And, and we get to see Jordy uh, back in the circle very soon. Rumor has it, Mitch, you have seven courtside seats for Sunday. Is that true? No, I'm going to be sitting in the, in the, uh, in the media overflow section, wherever Jeff Grish wants to put me, um, jumping on the Nebraska women's basketball beat um, to see Caitlin Clark. Well, um, maybe, uh, a- again, as we tape right now, Iowa is playing. Um, it's Thursday night, and the Hawks are playing uh, against Penn State at home. And Caitlin Clark was held to five points in the first quarter, two of seven shooting, one of four from three-point range. Now, she'll probably finish with 40 in this game, <laughs> and everything will be good and, and a green light for her to break the NCAA women's basketball scoring record in Lincoln on Sunday, but um, the national media, I'm not talking about myself, the, the national media are descending on Lincoln this Sunday, some 15 to 20 strong um, from the likes of ESPN and Yahoo and other publications. Um, my colleague Chantel Jennings, who covers women's basketball and women's sports on a national level is coming in and everybody's anticipating that Caitlin Clark is going to break the record at, as did the, some of the many of the 15,500 people who bought tickets to make it the first sellout for women's basketball ever at Pinnacle Bank Arena. So she needs 66 points coming in tonight to break the record. And she's probably going to have to go for about 30 to make it a a likely scenario that it happens in Lincoln. Um, It's going to be a spectacle uh, if she, if she hits her average tonight and and comes in with a shot at it. Um, You know, I know that uh, Nebraska women's basketball would prefer that this not happen (laughs) <laughs> on on their watch, they they don't really want to be the uh, the, the the hosts for for such a historic event. Um, they'll take it if they can find a way to win the game while she breaks the record. But there's an inter- interesting dynamic 
um, at play over I the last four seasons between Caitlin Clark and Nebraska women's basketball. And I wrote somewhat of, some about that um, in a story that's out Friday um, on the athletic. You Let's just say that they, that they, uh, they don't, you know, she's not the most beloved player in the in the uh, to come into PBA. But even if she's 61 points away as she currently stands, whenever <laughs> she enters Lincoln, I've seen her play in Lincoln before, and I I don't think there's any number she can't reach. She loves playing in Lincoln. She loves playing against Nebraska. She loves putting up gaudy numbers like 61. That's not out of the question for her. you. Say he puts up 39 to put her within reach. She's in reach at 66. All right, I'm I'm all about the show here. Okay, uh, and then she's averaging like. 30 some points a game against Nebraska in her career. So yeah, if she needs 30, they could probably get her 30. But if I'm Iowa and the game is not close, Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, you know what, Caitlin, we know you could have done it, but we want to take this road show back home. Cause I think they play at home after Nebraska, right? They do. They play Michigan next week. Okay. So would you rather, have her get the record. And I think Nebraska, despite the fact there's the rivalry, I think they would be respectful and say, sure. let's get the golf clap out and congratulations on a wonderful night. I don't think Amy Williams will go dandy knee on Steve Johnson with baby minor, uh, baby Jordan, Harold minor, you know, <laughs> setting the Devaney center scoring record. Right. Uh, you know, uh, back in what well, gosh, that's about 30 some years ago. Yeah. Harold Miner goes for 49 and Steve Johnson, the PA announcer for Nebraska, congratulates him on setting the new <laughs> new, new scoring record in the Devaney Center. And Danny goes all Danny Nee goes all Brooklyn on him, right? Yeah, here comes a broken Budweiser bottle. Right. Never so I, I think I think that Nebraska would be classy and respectful and 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 they would uh honor the moment and and that would be that in a sign of sportsmanship, right? Because it is historic. But I think if you're Iowa and and you want this this show to continue, you're going to stop just shy. You're going to let her sit out the last couple of minutes. Now, if it's a close game and they need her, you're not going to give up the win, right? But if the opportunity is there for her to set the record at home, let the streamers fly, let the statue be unveiled, the jersey's already going to be retired, whatever they want, I think Iowa – ought to just put it on ice until they can get it back home and get it done there because the video, the show will be much more spectacular if she does it there. Also, I hope that Lynette Woodard gets her due. Okay? Much like Tracy Chapman is getting her due with Luke Combs and Fast Car, Lynette Woodard back in the 70s in the NCAA, pre-NCAA. right? Pre-NCAA, over 4,000 points in her her career. Wow. She played at Kansas, no three point line, no women's basketball, uh, to do what she did and went on to play for the Harlem Globe Trotters. I hope that the, the community of women's basketball, yes, celebrates Caitlin Clark, but goes back and honors one of the great pioneers of the women's game at a time when nobody else was paying attention. 4,000 points. I mean, that's, Remote. She blew Pete Maravich out of the water. Pete Maravich holds the 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 men's scoring mm-hmm. record. It's in thirty six hundred range, and and Clark, you know, as long as she makes a shot tonight and and continues making shots, um, as I watch them one after another rim out, um, she's going to break Pete break Pete Maravich's record uh, for for NCAA at any level. But you're right, uh, Lynette Woodard should be should be recognized. Average Joe Sports Show, episode 29. That's Bill Dolman, Mitch Sherman, Elijah Herbal, Chris Schmidt. You can uh, subscribe to us, the AJ Sports Pod. Uh, follow us on Twitter, the AJ Sports Show on YouTube. And as always, hit the like button and find us on Spotify and iTunes as well. Tell a friend, give us a rating, good, bad, or ugly. We are all about the feedback. It is Super Bowl time, Super Bowl 58. And time to make some predictions and thoughts on the game. Not a ton of buzz with this matchup. I mean, uh, it's the the two teams that we all could have circled to start the season. I think we're all wowed by Mahomes. Yeah. Um, I'm fascinated. Well, says I'm, the I'm gen- generally fan. annoyed by Mahomes, but sure. Wow, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by the the Swift Kelsey sidebar, and oh yeah, by the way, how about old Brock Purdy? And what he's done with some great toys. Can Shanahan get it done? Great storylines. But if San Fran does this, they're favored. It's going to be because of the run game. 
And it's going to be the run game. It's going to be McCaffrey going off, and it's going to be their assortment of rushing specialists, the Boses, the Gregories, the uh, Armsteads. They've, they've got dudes to get after the quarterback. Everyone's going and saying you can't beat Mahomes, you can't doubt Mahomes, you can't doubt that KC defense. Don't disagree. And KC uh, wins this by running the football. San Francisco has been torched on the ground. So whoever runs it well and uh, sticks to it, there's your winner on Sunday. There's my analysis. So we're going with the Isaiah Pacheco for MVP prop. Um, is that what you're thinking? <laughs> I Well, I think Isaiah Pacheco for, you know, 20 totes and 80 some yards is what he's been averaging. Our dear friend Danny Burke mm-hmm. told us. Uh, I think McCaffrey is electrifying and is as much as you like all the, the weapons to catch the football from pretty man. Uh, the McCaffrey's got a different gear. He's such a weapon. He's a pain in the neck to tackle and, and deal with that size and speed. Uh, yeah. Uh, those are the, the, the two guys that decide this uh, aside from the quarterbacks and turnovers going to be a running game. I like the chief's defense going a totally different direction. Um, no, I think, you're I right. think that the Chiefs defense has been the that's the reason that 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 Kansas City is in this place. Um, every other Super Bowl, it's been all about Mahomes and Kelsey and Tyreek Hill and the great weapons that, that Kansas City's had offensively unstoppable. But the defense is these defensive guys are the unsung heroes for Kansas City and Chris Jones and that group. I think they get it done and and hold McCaffrey. You, you, you can't you can't stop him, but I think they're going to hold him down somewhat, keep him contained. And um, Kansas City comes out with maybe a, maybe a, a victory that isn't as uh, as as viewer pleasing as what people have come to expect with these Chiefs, but they'll find a way to get it done. Um, I like Kansas City to repeat. They've won ugly this year, though, Mitch. They've won uglier than yeah. in past it, years. Yeah, and, and that's that's what I'm that's what I'm predicting. Another one. Okay, I've been diving into the the spreadsheets, the podcasts, the stats all week <laughs> long all week long getting ready for this game. The first thing I will say is that based on those numbers, well, half based on those numbers, uh, I know that sports fandom is built on heartbreak. Let's lay that out. Sports fandom built on heartbreak. Taylor Swift, according to my numbers, has been a fan of football for roughly three months. (laughs) (laughs) She has yet to experience heartbreak. You know, you know, this Chiefs team has been good. They've lost some games, but she hasn't experienced any real heartbreak. She's due. It's the law of averages. You can't be a sports fan for three months and watch your team win it all. That's just not how it works. The sports gods wouldn't allow it. The football gods won't allow it. That's why, based on vibes and vibes alone, I think the 49ers win this game. If you look at the stats, I think a difference in this game, not a lot of people talk about them. It's not the sexiest position in the NFL anymore. But Dre Greenlaw and Fred Warner are two game changers at linebacker. Two dudes that are rangy. They're fast. You think they'd both play really, really well in a Matt Rule offense with how well they get sideline to sideline. I'm not saying they shut down Travis Kelsey. I think they present a different type of matchup for him than the linebackers and safeties that the the Chiefs have faced thus far in their playoff run. I think that's uh, just uh, some guys to watch out for as being guys that could potentially slow down Pacheco, potentially slow down Kelsey. Obviously, those guys are going to get theirs. But I think those guys, if those guys have a good game on Sunday, it could be what the 49ers need to, to just give themselves enough of a boost for their offense to score enough points and get the win. I just want to say I've got a Taylor Swift super fan living under my roof <laughs> and listening to the lyrics of the song that I hear coming out of that bedroom She's experienced plenty of heartbreak. (laughs) She's got four albums and several billion dollars worth of sales of heartbreak. (laughs) That's a great point. Yeah, but But, she never had had Ken Calhoun stick a hand out (laughs) and flick the two-point conversion away from Jeff Smith denying Tom Osborne the national championship back in 1983. She doesn't know that kind of heartbreak. Elvis Elvis Bleep and Peacock, his middle initial, his middle name starts with an F if you listen to my dad. <laughs> Keith, Keith Jackson. She yeah, okay. So uh so um it's to you, I, Bill. <laughs> I, I don't think uh I, I don't I don't anticipate it being, you know, one of the those those the Super Bowls that we're gonna be talking about for years to come. I, I think that two positions are gonna play the key role and it's kinda like what we talked about already. I think it's the the running back position on both sides, McCaffrey and Pacheco, and the tight end position. That's what, those are going to be the possession players that are going to advance the chains. Uh, Kelsey and Kittle, 
um, at their respective positions. Uh, I think we'll move the chains and be the bailout for both quarterbacks. So, uh, so I think maybe that's kind of a draw, actually, because I think Pacheco's been fantastic. Uh, McCaffrey always seems to come up with a huge play in the second quarter for that team, right? Now, I, I also – but I think the coaching – and I think you know, San Francisco has not played well in the playoffs. You know, Green Bay played well. They kind of eked out that win. And then love, love it or hate the, the decisions made by Dan Campbell, uh, Detroit, for the most part, outplayed San Francisco – in the last game. So uh, I'm not exactly sure that, that San Francisco on the sidelines has had the playoffs figured out. Meanwhile, uh, Andy Reid has been fantastic. His demeanor is terrific. His team just plods along and wins in one way or the other. I think that his demeanor over is the umbrella over his team, right? And so I think in that regard, I think the edge goes to Kansas City. Plus, San Francisco, Cisco having to practice at UNLV's field. I don't know how you overcome that. Right. I mean, that's just, <laughs> there's just no way to have that happen to you. Just the, ask uh, him about it. Yeah. I mean, this, that's just disastrous. You, you can't overcome those kind of preparations. So I, I, I think, think they're staying at like Reed the days in too, right? City. What's that? They put, they put him at the days in, right? It, on the, all, down, it was. It was downtown. the days in. It's now the Super 8. No, well, <laughs> okay. This is le- legitimately true. Both teams are are staying outside of Las Vegas, I assume, to keep players from that, that draw of the strip. Yeah, they're staying at Lake Las Vegas. Um, so they're, they're at res- giant resorts 20 miles away from the strip. Not exactly uh, – the days Ooh, in, but uh, they're, yeah, they're, 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 I'm sure, I'm sure it's, it's a tough life this week out, out there. <laughs> so three Niners and one, uh, excuse me, three Chiefs and one Niners. Uh, Elijah's the holdout. I could never take the Chiefs. Are you no, kidding me? <laughs> yeah. it's your, you get your Bronco gear taken away. We'll be back at you next week. Another edition of the Average Joe Sports Show. Thanks so much for subscribing. The AJ Sports Pod, the AJ Sports Show, Twitter and YouTube. Uh, and uh, Spotify and iTunes. Uh, Give us a follow that way. Bill Goldman, Mitch Sherman, Elijah Herbal, Chris Schmidt, back at you next time with the Average Show Sports Show.